everybody. Welcome to the Profit Roadmap. We're your hosts, Ryan and Becca. This is the premier podcast created for field service pros to help you grow your business, stay on top of the latest trends, and help you provide even more value to the communities that you serve. Today, we have a double feature for you. we got two guests that are here to talk about something that we all struggle with, which is getting paid on time. So we're going to talk about how to recognize revenue efficiently, plus why some field services companies should consider financing for customers. Now, we are excited to welcome Mike Callahan from Simple Growth Systems, a service autopilot certified advisor specialized in the development of next level automations within our software. Uh, Mike got a start in the industry by mowing lawns to pay his car insurance and grew his business to a, a pretty large size, so much so that he had to reevaluate the business so that it could be maintained uh, with the right automated systems in place for sustainable and scalable growth, which is why he started Simple Growth. Now, we're also joined by Jen Morris, the business development manager for Optimus Contractor Financing by EGIA, an innovative platform that helps service businesses offer financing solutions for their clients. Mike and Jen, welcome to the Profit Roadmap. How are you guys doing today? Hey, Good. Thanks for uh, having us. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bounce around between you guys. Um, uh, let's, Mike, let's start with you. You've got a bit of a unique story. Could you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? Yeah, Ryan. So uh, started uh, kind of as you alluded there, starting cutting grass uh, in high school to just basically pay for a car and car insurance. Um, as we grew that business um, after five years of college, going into college, had about three full time crews. And as I started to go out and actually look at uh, businesses I admired locally, not even lawn care, but uh, construction, different different contracting businesses, um, the model that seemed to be successful that I looked up to is all these business owners were building a business that revolved around them. Um, and through the different classes in college, um, even the t- professors teaching it who own these businesses had these business models that revolved around the business owner as, as the, basically the single point of failure. Uh, but that I was completely unaware of at that point. So uh, after college, I uh, made that fateful decision to go corporate or run the business. Uh, as you can guess, as we're sitting here, I went to the self, self-employment route. Um, but what the, uh, all, the what I didn't know is this business, literally, I couldn't leave a day or two, three days at a pop without this thing falling apart. Uh, so it ended up literally causing a divorce. I ended up hiring, or uh, marrying the girl uh, from high school through college, and uh, she came home literally on Valentine's Day, if you haven't heard the story, and literally said, Mike, I'm out of here. This business runs your life. So kind of after hitting rock bottom, uh, searching on the Internet, as many of us do, looking for a CRM such as Service Autopilot or Field Edge, um, I found across a something called uh, automations and lifecycle marketing. So uh, literally spent four or five winters when it wasn't snowing at the kitchen table, not going to the office. We automated the whole entire business. So uh, from working 80 to 100 hours a week, seven days a week, which caused that divorce, uh, we ended up going from literally four to five hours a week to an absentee owner at 30 days at a pop to eventually a uh, venture capital group found our Facebook and content and actually came in to acquire the company. Um, and eventually selling it. And then we started this uh, secondary business called Simple Growth, where our mission is to help business owners take their life back from the business so they can avoid the pitfalls I ran through and currently employing uh, probably 10 or 12 previous service autopilot owner or service autopilot users um, that were past clients that have actually automated their business, sold it and coming back in the late 30s and early 40s saying, Mike, what do we do? Um, so we, uh, the rumor on the block is we collect <laughs> contractors. So, uh, we have a very, uh, decent sized team of 29 <laughs> to 30 people that help, that help business owners automate their businesses. And that's kind of where we're at. That's amazing. That's awesome. I love that. How about you, Jen? What's your background with Optimus? Uh, well, I certainly did not start by mowing lawns. That's for sure. <laughs> 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 it's a little bit of a different storyline. Um, I was a stay at home mom my husband's construction company for many years um, and then, um, you know, went through a a life change and started working for a local HVAC contractor in my area and grew his business um, over the course of several years and discovered EGIA, um, discovered how growing that business, how offering financing to our customers was such an important part of that. And through discovering EGIA, you know, I realized that, well, I can go and work for a nonprofit and help more than just one contractor. So I came over to EGIA a little over two years ago and now on the business development side of things and really just taking the opportunity to grow contractors' success and profitability through the use of consumer financing and other, other business tools and partnering them with proper CRM, digital marketing companies, and full scope service. Uh, no, Jen, I think that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, no, I love that. 
going to say you both kind of spoke on something that's uh, pretty important. I like, so I'm a trainer too on the service level pilot side of Explore. And that's like one of the big thing is I hear is like, I don't have time for my family. So Mike, I know I've spoken to so many clients that have, that work with you. Uh, <laughs> I've even, I know there's, there have been points where some people are like, okay, you need to speak to Mike because like you, because you do more than automations. You do a little bit more hand-holding stuff too with like implementation and service autopilot. Um, so yeah, I was just going to like speak, it asked you both, like if you could speak more on that, like just the, like what it's like as a business owner needing more time like for your family and yourself and your life and just all of that, like how important that is for you, just your business as well. Yeah, so I, I think there's there's really there's there's different stages of business and there's different growth hurdles. Um, and, and one of the biggest hurdles we find is actually time and time management. So, uh, Becky, you really hit on it. Like simple growth, when we do this as a certified advisor, uh, we did start in automations. Um, but the issue is ethically, a lot of people came in and um, to put to put it a bit bluntly, like their their operations were a hot mess. We couldn't automate it because we would have ten x the problem. So. Doing an upsell automation, for instance, 60 to 80 estimate requests, literally in the first 24 to 48 hours, when they're set up properly with the right content, um, that's what we see. So obviously, if you don't have proper systems built in for job costing, estimating, a um, whole bunch of other things, that, that's basically where our coaching division comes in. Uh, but speaking to time, time especially right off the bat is um, when we go in and set up basically six pillars of success to hit a seven figures and beyond, the first one is actually time management. So how do we actually block out our time and stop from working on it and working in it, as Michael Gerber said. So it's really just blocking out that time. Um, and one of the simple tricks is literally going into the Google Calendar or G Suite for business and actually blocking out some time to strategically have that in there. Um, and even on the simple growth time, like a lot of the contractors that come work for us don't necessarily have all those skills ironed out yet. I know I didn't in the early days. So we'll actually go through and part of our onboarding and training and teach them how to manage their calendar and, and how not to be in firefighting mode 24 seven. Um, but traditionally with most contractors we're working with, we look to have uh, basically about four hours a week that they should have strategically blocked out that that's time to work on the business. Um, and then the second pillar is going in and taking care of their, their personal and business financials. Um, and then we continue down the road, but those are the biggest areas right there off the bat. If somebody's watching or listening to this, that you got to take care of the time to be able to work on that business to get it together. And then you got to get those finances together. What we see a lot of times is contractors come to us and say, Hey, Jen, you know, I need, I know that I need to be able to offer financing, but I just don't have time to even think about it. I don't have time to develop it into my, my business plan. You know, let's talk about, you know, sometimes there's cost related to financing or things like that. And it's just so overwhelming the, the concept of adding another facet to your business can overwhelm business owners to the point where they just choose to not make a decision whatsoever. And that really just creates that, you know, that, that stagnancy and, and lack of growth. And so we try to say, okay, let's just give me 20 minutes here. Let's just get this, pro this one process set up and then we can take it one step at a time. You know, we don't have to eat the whole elephant in one bite, as they might say, right? We can parcel it out, but really just showing them, okay, just take a little bit of time here and we'll see a lot of growth in the long term. Nice. Yeah. Hey, and Jen hit and on something. Comes something to... I was going to say, Jen hit on something there that is worth talking for a second mm -hmm. is a simple business, a simple business model. Um, and Jen, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it, but a lot of contractors come in and they're offering 15 different services. And it's just not scalable. A simple business that's scalable, two to three core services that could be gateway services sold over the phone, and maybe two to three ancillary services at most that could be upsold to, to raise that client lifetime value through an upsell or expansion process. Um, but Jen, Jen hit it. I, I'm glad you mentioned that simple process because we see it every day. Yeah, that's something that uh, I work on Field Services Academy a lot, and a uh, phrase that gets thrown, a lot, thrown around a lot is simple is scalable. So uh, I think you said it word for word there, Mike. Okay. Uh, so Jen, you talked a little bit about financing, uh, and I think financing is something that opens a lot of doors for contractors, uh, particularly as it you know, goes to getting paid and stuff on time. Uh, for anybody who's not familiar with the services that Optimus offers, uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what exactly it is that you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. So Optimus is a state-of-the-art financing platform that is provided by EGIA, a uh, nonprofit contractor trade association. And what we do is we have taken things to the next level. We see the, the industry changes, right? There's some uncertainty in the economy, different things. Um, we have other things coming up in contractors' industries where 
their consumers are going to want to be holding on to their money a little bit tighter. And so by using affordable monthly payments helps to close more sales and increase higher average tickets because it's easier for our customers to say yes to $120 a month than it is to go find ten or twelve thousand dollars to do it to take care of a job that maybe isn't a luxury but a requirement, especially if you're in the southeast with HVAC, right? Um, that's a requirement, not a luxury. So what we do is we partner our contractors with three tiered lenders. So no matter the customer's credit profile, we're seeing about ninety to ninety four percent approval rates on all of the applications that our contractors run, which industry wide is, is just it's at the top. Amazing. That's huge. And Mike, uh, chasing out payments is something that a lot of people do struggle with. Um, from an automation standpoint, are there any automations or anything that you recommend to help contractors get paid? Yeah, Ryan. And I think, honestly, a lot of people are scared by the term automations. Um, so really not to be self-serving, really in the mindset of abundance. Before you even automate, I think really we need to look at the basics of a business and cash flow, uh, especially in a service business. So if you're looking at lawn care, home cleaning, uh, even H -H HVAC, if you're doing a general service, um, really the thing is to get a credit card on file. So that, that's a necessity. Um, and a lot of people are concerned about getting that credit card on file because you're looking at two and a half to three percent processing fees. But really, Ryan and Becca, it, it, we're not really worried about that because if we're setting up our financials as that second step of our setting that simple <laughs> business, we need to be incorporating that cost of processing into our overhead recovery and our hourly rates. So if we're running a million dollar business, it sounds kind of crazy. I'm going to spend $30,000 on credit card processing fees. That's built into your hourly rate. We're not charging extra up and above. Once again, we're creating that simple plan there. Um, so one of the biggest things, uh, at least in my lawn care business, when we first got into service autopilot, um, is the ability to put a credit card on file with a PCI compliant credit card form. So it's tokenized. The contractor is not at risk. There's some reassurance for the actual consumer as well. But once we've got that credit card on file, we should be running on a daily basis for any one-time services. And at a bare minimum, if we're doing a reoccurring weekly mowing, weekly cleaning, any of the services like that, uh, the way we did it, and I got to give credit where credit's due, uh, co-founder of Service Autopilot, John Petoshnik, uh, was a huge advocate of this. But basically, everything we did this week, the following Tuesday, with two to three clicks of button, we're running out those credit cards. So it may be six, 700 credit card processing, literally in two to three minutes. But the key there is when you run it on Tuesday, that money is in the bank for payroll for the work that already happened. So that is really the foundational piece. Now, when you want to take it to the next level and automate it, we can go in through a welcome and acclimation process when they become a client, and we can get that PCI compliant credit card form automatically emailed to them with some triggers to make sure if that card's not on file, somebody in the office is not scheduling because that's a requirement of the service. Um, the second part of that is is going in and setting up automations based on uh, overdue invoices, accounts receivables. So you're looking from 1 to 30, 31 to 60, 61 to 90, and 90 pass. And what you can do is set up pre-built automations based on that, uh, where they're at in that customer life cycle or payment delinquency cycle, and start to escalate that, whether it's text messages, emails, uh, ringless voicemail bombs, or potentially when they get past 90, uh, we can actually have a process that have someone on the hook with a ticket or a to-do to actually send that to collection. So uh, with the automations, it gives each company the ability to set it up however they want to process it. But at bare minimum, if you're past seven days um, and you're not running those credit cards each day, we should have that automation trigger somebody to actually pause that service um, because we never really want to get out past that. But that's the beauty of an all-in-one CRM with no multiple system chaos. So uh, SA and several of the other platforms under the Field Edge um, umbrella have the ability to have a lot of these features underneath uh, one software, and it triggers off the, the native statuses where you may have three or four different softwares if you don't have that service autopilot. Um, that you're kind of doing manual data entry back across, and that's where mistakes happen. So the beauty of the software is everything happens under one roof, get the credit card on file, and then you follow up with the automations. We had one client, uh, Brian, that just joined SA probably last year, social media influence. I think he cleared about $34,000 of overdue invoices in the first week of just yeah. flipping the uh, the automations on. And it, it goes back to the time piece. He just didn't have the time to chase his money. He was in the field doing the work, doing the work. We're like, hey, Brian, you got to get paid here. Let's spend 10 minutes and get this on here for you. So that's, that's the power of the automations. But the main thing is let's get that credit card on file. Let's not worry about the fees, build that into our overhead recovery rate and run those cards on a daily or at least a weekly basis. So it's definitely 
uh, at least in Brian, especially in Brian's case, as an example, right? It's it's worth it to find the time. He said, made, was it thirty four thousand? Yeah, right around thirty four, thirty five thousand. Um, wow. Yeah, he posted right in the Facebook group. I won't mention his last name, but I mean, if you look back in the feed, yeah. like it literally was legit. <laughs> I mean, it was like bam. Yeah. Um, you know, for the price of the automations, it's pennies <clears throat> on the dollar. I was going to say, yeah, break that out in the hourly wages, 34K. Yeah, and, and I think the biggest thing is is people are looking at this too. Like they think that automations is going to replace a person. Really what we're looking for is we're not looking to replace headcount. We're looking to replace the, the repetitive and mundane tasks that nobody likes to do, nobody likes to babysit, and they just happen. And the cool thing is with automating some of the tickets, or not, uh, which used to be to-dos, we can tell everybody what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And if it doesn't happen, it escalates it to a manager owner to jump in. So we can leverage the power of the software to make sure the systems and the SOPs you have in place happen without you having to babysit it. Because that's when you get 30, 40 employees, you basically become a glorified babysitter unless you have these systems in place. Oh, for sure. Or you have like that instance, like that fear of replacing a person. But sometimes I'm speaking with people, I'm sure you've seen it, Mike, and maybe Jin, Jin probably yourself too, is like, someone that does it all. They don't have those at that office staff. They don't have field technicians. They're doing absolutely everything. So automation is a huge time saver, um, huge, huge time saver for them. Um, so Mike, are you saying that they should get off the check and cash if they're all their customers on credit cards? Once again, simple business. So at the end of the days at Callahan's, we didn't accept checks. We didn't accept cash. You had to have a credit card on five because once again, now you got three different options and three different ways to train and three different things you have to track. Everything's coming on a credit card. It's coming through clearance. Everything's zed mm -hmm. out and then it goes into your account. And now that's actually made your bookkeeping and everything else significantly, um, you know, more streamlined. And, and to Jen's point, like literally we could, we could tie into something like Jen does. If you're the contractor, you can have the link to uh, whatever the application form is going out to the consumer to actually fill these things in. So it doesn't just um, deal with the internal processes, but you can tie into a vendor um, like Jen has here and be able to do, do that as well. So there's a lot of multifaceted things yes. that we look at and how we in integrate them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Mike, on, on our side, we see across our contractor basis that Truly, there's only about 10% of customers that are truly cash or check buying. We find that about 40% want to put things on their credit card. You know, maybe they want their Sky Miles points or whatever. <laughs> but we do find that when contractors offer financing to every customer every time, about 50% of consumers choose to go that financing route. And, you know, when we think about it from that consumer perspective, what are all the different things that, that we finance, right? I mean, Obviously, our houses, our cars, probably. But when was the last time you dropped twelve hundred dollars for a cell phone? Bill? You know, for a new cell phone, rather than putting that twenty five dollars a month on the bill, right? Um, I mean, I was buying my son new shoes the other day on Zappos, and it was like, hey, you could pay fifty bucks for these shoes or ten affordable payments of you know five dollars each. You know, I mean, I, I could finance, and I guess I don't, didn't need to, but I didn't want to at that time. But you know, when we think about it in our in our you know, society right now, everything is financeable. And so yeah, I think to hit, for the contractors yeah. to be able to take that. Yeah, and to hit on Jen, that, Jen, like I'm obviously I'm assuming um, people are seeing this post COVID, especially everybody's on Amazon, they're on, on Zappos. All the, there is that finance thing, so it's not an uncommon thing. Same thing with the credit cards, um, but speed kills right now, so we need to be able to close that that in there. So if they have the ability to click a link and fill out that finance form and get pre approved what you're doing is literally cutting down that sales cycle and your competitors may take weeks to actually have that whole process closed in where they're ready to buy. You've given them the financing. It's a simple one or two step process and it's done. You've closed that sale quick. Yeah, absolutely. And with, with the Optimist platform um, for our contractors, they can do that pre-qualification for financing. It takes less than two minutes and it doesn't even impact the customer's credit score. It's a soft credit pool. Uh, even better. So, you know, we call it, a lot of times, know before you go technology, have it on your website, you know, have it in, within your dispatching, you know, CRM tools, say, hey, you're, you know, your technician or your guy's on the way, but hey, click here if you want to go ahead and get pre-qualified for financing. And that way it does cut down on that sales cycle. And, you know, once you step into that customer's home, you know, hey, here's what their potential credit line is, what type of uh, lender prime, subprime, near prime that they may qualify for. So you're really armed with all of that extra information just, you know, before you even step foot in the door. That's amazing. That makes and life like, easy. 
Yeah, make life easy for you. <laughs> so is it like for reoccurring for gin, um, like financing, is it typically project work with your contract or reoccurring work, just everything? Um, yeah, everything. You know, our contractors, we don't do anything in the home improvement basis. Um, you know, certainly HVAC, electrical, plumbing, roofing, siding, windows, doors, landscape, hardscape, you know, really anything so that they would have that opportunity. Awesome. Yeah. And Jen, I think the, the part you didn't hit on there, which I'm sure you're probably thinking about is like once they've filled out that credit app, they, you've emotionally taken them off the market because now they've actually committed to it. You know if they're qualified. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is literally, I mean, that's the key. So with that quick two, one to two minute financing option, they've emotionally started to commit to that process. So that salesperson should be able to close them very quickly and they're technically pre-qualified. So you've overcome a lot of the sales objections or hurdles right there, right off the bat. So I love that kind of integration, nice. that product. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, from the consumer side, it reduces that anxiety, that stress. If it is a, I, I need a repair or something right now, you know, how am I going to afford it? If I can know that in the privacy of my own home on a, a website, I can get pre-qualified for financing, then I can be like, okay, now I feel more confident to make that appointment, have that technician or have that contractor come out to give me that quote, that estimate, because now all of a sudden that affordability has shown up and it reduces my anxiety as the consumer. So it makes life better on both ends for sure, right? Yeah. Less anxiety, contractors getting paid, you've got options. So if you want to be a cash buyer, yeah, you can be a cash buyer, but you can finance it if you want to, if that's easier on you. Like you said, it takes that burden off. Uh, Mike, you, you're talking about objections, uh, and we were also talking about getting a bunch of credit cards. Uh, you said you didn't take cash or check, uh, so it's basically all just credit card and, and whatnot. So uh, one of the, when I talk to contractors about that, one of the objections that I get is like, oh, no one's going to want to give me their credit card. Right. What's your what's your experience with that? Where it's uh, people don't want to give me their credit card, whatever it is. Yeah. Part of it is is being upfront and actually being uh, a trusted to the point where you get to that conversation. They already know you. They like you and they trust you. So a uh, great read if you haven't hit, read is They Ask You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. Uh, we talk about in that book or he talks about in that book, all the um, basically objections or concerns of hiring a contractor. So Marcus owned a company called River Pools and Spas. Uh, about the same time uh, I started the lawn care company and Marcus and I were doing a lot of the same things. So we were producing social media content or Facebook videos, just like we do with Simple Growth. Um, and in our different marketing copy, we addressed the consumer's concerns. So let's just face it, before we get to the credit card processing, people don't trust contractors and they don't trust themselves to hire a contractor. Um, there is, there's just nightmare stories day after day on social media, the news, upstate New York, Rochester, where I live happens every year. A gentleman just got convicted of um, like grand larceny, basically theft. He had a hundred elderly people were, who paid all cash for the snow plowing and he never showed up. I mean, this happens literally between mm -hmm. Rochester, Buffalo and Syracuse. Somebody gets arrested every year. Um, so contractors have a very, very bad name. Well, we made a video about this and we literally talked about this issue for snow removal. And we said, listen, um, we require a credit card on file. It protects you uh, as a consumer. We use a PCI compliant form, our credit card thing. And basically, you're, we're protecting you. And th th there's a benefit to this. Um, but we're addressing those concerns up front of compliance and security before they even ask it. So literally, uh, as part of our marketing uh, content, either long written or videos, they're, they're absorbing this. And we're addressing all their concerns up front. Very similar to a lawn mowing example. The biggest concern in my market is what happens if it rains or what happens if the contractor doesn't close the fence gate behind him. All of our copy is addressing those uh, service specific concerns up front before they're ever addressed. So traditionally, by the time they get to my office or a virtual assistant, those, those questions are already answered. And really it's a hard right now, even with simple growth, you pay with a credit card or you're not a client. And that's just the way we operate. Uh, you introduce cash or checks, a lot of times that's going to require the business owner to actually go halfway across town to pick cash up. Your time's more valuable doing other things strategically and visionary than running halfway around the town to grab cash. Um, but it sets the tone also in the business, I believe, that, um, and from the consumer end, that we're doing things on the up and up. We're not paying cash payroll. We're not dealing with cash. Um, this is a legit business. and You can trust us. Nice. So I was going to actually piggyback off of that, that uh, question that Ryan asked is what if you have like an existing customer base and for both of you, Mike and Jen, like 
and they are used to a certain way with cash or check. How do you like, I have a lot of people that I speak to, they're afraid to tell their clients like, Hey, we're doing this new process. We're doing cards only or financing and all this. Like, how would you say that tips are to talk to their existing customer base and like getting them through that transition? Yeah. Jenna, let, uh, let you answer that one first. If you got, got some feedback on it. Um, yeah, I, I think that it really just goes back to a lot of what Mike was talking about with have you, have you built up that trust and your brand management, right? So if they trust you and say, okay, we know this, and they know that you're moving into a different direction in order to help protect them and their fellow consumers, then, you know, to me, it, it really shouldn't be that challenging. And if we think about it, if we have customers that aren't willing to change and grow with us, mm -hmm. then we may have outgrown that customer base. You know, there, there may be a different consumer marketplace for, for where that business is headed, would be my two cents. Yeah, I, I guess I'll kind of open up with the biggest mistake I made is I didn't rip the Band-Aid off. So the first year we did it, we gave them the option to do credit card. Obviously no cash, but check. And if you're grandfathered in, you could still pay by check. Everybody knew it had to be credit card. That created Tammy in the office who actually is still running finance for Simple Growth. Um, she stayed on board after we sold, like, that was the biggest disaster of 12 months of Tammy. Like Tammy literally was going to kick me out of the office that I, that I that basically <laughs> I own. So I will tell you, don't do that. Um, it's a massive mistake. Rip the bandaid off. Uh, surprisingly, especially past COVID, it's not an issue. Like it's paperless. People are going to be cool with it. Uh, but, but the people that don't put the card on file are the ones that probably aren't going to pay you. And they're also pain in the butt. They're mm -hmm. not a good fit. Um, so it's almost a, it's a qualifier to be honest with you. Oh, so yeah, Mike, you said it a little bit better than I did on that one. <laughs> well, we, we, we both been yeah, through the contractor gauntlet. I mean, if, if, if there was something to do wrong, we've probably done it multiple times. We've learned, and a couple times we got lucky. Uh, but I will tell you, that was the biggest mistake. Uh, gentleman Garrett Matthews, owns, uh, Matthews Tree and Pest, he's running a little north of $5 million a year. Um, and Garrett... Literally, when we decided to do it about the same time, he ripped the Band-Aid off. And, man, was he he was 6 to 12 months down the road, fast, like, ahead of us, um, just because he just said, you know what, we're going to do it. Um, but it's not uncommon now. So if you're, if you're listening to this or watching this, um, I'm here to tell you, with working hundreds of contractors every year, uh, most of them making that shift after they work with us, it, it's a game changer, especially for cash flow. Yeah. You both kind of mentioned something similar about like maybe like mentioned brand management, Jen, and then like maybe you've outgrown the, the customer and similar back as well. So are you saying that there could be a time where you may have to fire a client? And if you do, like you should obviously hopefully have a plan of like gaining new customers in to alleviate that kind of fear. Of, like, you know, maybe you're, you're missing a payment um, if you're fired, if you have to fire a client or something like that. Yeah, so I mean, basically, as you scale that business to hopefully seven figures and well beyond, uh, what got you there is not going to get you to the next level if you're looking to go to five to ten million and beyond. And, and depending on um, HVAC or design build, a lot of that is like there's a lot of product built in there. But I'm just talking like strictly labor, like a million and beyond, because mm -hmm. a lot of times there's a misconception. I've got this fifteen million dollar company, but seventy percent of its product, you really don't I mean you do but you really don't um but if you're actually looking at the size of that business what you get what gets gets you to a million is not going to get you to five to ten million and beyond um so that is part of like the scope so even at simple growth what got us to a million here as we we continue to go well past that um some of our service offerings we literally eliminated four to five different offerings because they were not simple and they weren't scalable um so that is going to be something that you want to take a look at it and hopefully in your infancy is like build a very simple scalable business. But as you get to certain points, there's going to be, you can't be everything to everyone. Um, and along those lines as well, uh, it's an unfortunate reality, but the skill set of your team and the actual business owner, um, kind of the same thing. What gets you to a certain point may not get you there. Um, so a gentleman, Clayton Mass said it best, who is the uh, CEO of Infusionsoft now keep, uh, Clayt says like, I am not the, the leader and, and I don't have the leadership skills to be your CEO at 300 million. But now that I'm at 200 million, I'm going to work on myself and become the leader I need to be, to be able to actually lead a $300 million company. Um, but it's the same thing, even in our smaller businesses. Um, I know the leadership skills that I had at a million weren't the same leadership skills I'm going to need at that five to 10 million mark. 
Um, and that's really a fifth stage of business. Um, so it's the business model, but the actual leadership, um, it kind of gets scary because we're hiring people that we don't know that are doing work um, out there we're not next to. And then those people we hire that we don't know hire people they don't know. And as it continues to get crazier, <laughs> that's where we create that simple business. But we need to actually go out and um, teach people how to be leaders and trainers. Um, and that's a skill set that they don't teach in school. I wish they did. Th they should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got a five-year degree for uh, basically time management, uh, how, to, how to mix in some partying with some school. That's about it. <laughs> uh, I was going through high school. They didn't have home ec anymore. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We should so, teach that uh, in high school. Yeah. Sure. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, going from like, uh, you know, like a third stage of business, fourth stage, fifth stage, all that stuff. If we were to go back to the very, very beginning, it's a question for both of you guys. Uh, someone's just starting their service business. What are some of the most important things that they could do uh, in y'all's eyes to lay the uh, foundation for that profitability? I mean, I would say on, on my side, and, and I mean, Mike talks a lot about you know simple and sustainable, but really having that budget in, and I think that's one thing that you know most contractors they they, they want to go do, they want to go fix, they want to go work on, they want to go create. Um, they don't want to be you know, playing around in Excel necessarily, but I would say by budgeting things. And, and even when we look at like the cost of credit card processing, right? That two to 3%, whatever that may be, same thing with financing, whatever that percentage might be, just like we budget for our payroll, for our trucks, for our insurance, you know, financing credit card processing is simply a cost of doing business. And when we incorporate that in from the get-go, then we kind of don't have to think about it too often. Maybe we go back and we check our budget once a quarter to make sure that we're headed in the right direction, right? Um, but for me, I would say that that is the, the must-have, you know. What about you, Mike? What do you think? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I would say, for instance, like it, it, one of the talks I did was like 350, maybe 400 people in the room. We talked about just literally knowing your break-even cost. Like what does it cost for you to operate before you make a profit? And it was a safe place and everybody was pretty honest. And I will tell you 85 to 90% of that room raised their hand and literally said they had no idea what it cost to operate their business. Um, and we look at it and it kind of break that down. But the scary thing is that I like to look at it as three ways we estimate, right? So first one is, is market-based pricing. So if we're looking at an example of lawn money, we go out and we look at that lawn, we're like, oh, my market is charging 55 bucks. That's what I'm assuming. Obviously not the way you want to do that at all. Run from that. Second is I call it something called guesstimating. So we've got a basic budget in. We know what we need to charge per man hour. Um, and we know what our operating costs are. So we may not have gotten into a production rate based estimating system based on square foot, linear fee, number of units. But at least I can look at a property um, somewhat non-emotionally with my, my industry expertise and say, okay, if that is a one hour job and I'm charging 65 bucks an hour, I need to charge 65 bucks an hour or 65 bucks for that job. And maybe I'm breaking even at 38 bucks an hour. The difference between that is our bottom line net profit. And then eventually when you're using a software program uh, by through a mobile device, you can clock in and out of the jobs in the drive time. And based on your guys and girls in the field and your equipment, you actually should be able to run some reports non-emotionally. How long does it actually take to produce a thousand square feet or, um, an AC maintenance job, whatever that is, we're able to actually look at non-emotionally based on our production rates. So uh, to Jen's point, yes, foundationally, we really, really need to know our operating costs. And uh, when you're going out and, and looking at your competitors, just be aware that probably 90% of them, if not more, have no idea what they're doing. They're literally throwing it against the wall and hoping it sticks. Um, and it, the shocking part is like, we'll go into a company that's running five, $6 million in sales. And that's usually when we come into the play um, for some of this consulting or coaching work um, is they realize, wow, if we continue this, we're playing Russian roulette with our finances. Like eventually that bullet's going to be in the chamber and it's not going to be good. So they're like, we need to fix this. Um, so right from the beginning, yes, foundationally, you should be building a budget. You should know your operating costs. And at a bare minimum, once a month, you should be reconciling that checkbook. And as Jen said, budget versus actual, where are we? Um, and basically one of those KPIs or key performance indicators we're looking at is budget versus actual on a daily and weekly basis. And then once we have that data in a CRM, we can run a report and say, if my goal was at 65 bucks an hour, what are all the people that are below that threshold and not emotionally? And I'm going to use the word not emotionally. We can raise the price up because the scariest thing is when mm -hmm. you don't know your budget and you don't know your numbers, 
Um, if you go on any of the Facebook groups of contractors, especially when gas went up and some other things, very similar to credit cards, like 3% of your budget, that's expensive. That's nothing. Gas is probably 2 to 3% at best as well. They were going in and raising their clients' pricing by 20 maybe 15%. And what they did is alienated their most profitable clients because you got clients in there that are making a hundred bucks an hour. If your goal is only 65, leave them alone. Just raise the losers up to the minimum. So you're hitting your hourly goals. Um, and that's the scary thing. If you don't know your numbers, you're crushing it on some and literally you're losing 20 bucks every time you go up to a house. You might as well just drop that $20 bill off the door and, and just walk away because that's, that's the reality of it. Um, so knowing those numbers, like Jen said, tracking it, and then actually having a cadence at least twice a year in a maintenance company, end of the year, November, December, and I recommend the week after July 4th, actually, to raise those prices, not emotionally, on the people not hitting your goal. Very similar like Jack Welch did with GE, where he took the bottom 10% and raised them up or got rid of them. Um, but I will tell you, the week after July 4th, if you go to raise somebody's prices, the chance of your consumer getting an estimate back in any timely fashion is almost 0%. So that's when we raised our prices. And even if it was a significant price, most people didn't leave because there was no other option. You said a word you threw around a lot there was non emotionally, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I would like too. to, I want to draw the distinction that non emotional doesn't mean detached, correct? Um, well, two it, it, it kind of, it, it, maybe it, there's it a balance. Be. Maybe there's a balance. Well, I mean, right. What we did, uh, it, we did is in the early days when we had to actually ex export our reports out of Service Autopilot. Now it can be done in a product that's mm -hmm. bolted on called Logi. Uh, but I would actually print it out uh, after I ran the the export, and I would hand it to Tammy. But when I was doing the the mathematical calculation, and there's actually a video out there of it, I actually would highlight the client's name and address in black so I couldn't see it, and I didn't know the pricing I gave it to her. So yes, actually, to an extent, it's non emotional financial management, but it was detached because if Mrs. Smith, my first client ever, which actually happened, um, we had to raise like <laughs> five, six bucks a visit. Um, and Grace was her name, great lady, lived in the back. But uh, it was it was interesting because she added, we were making money, but she added a bunch of trees in the back of the house that I was unaware of because I wasn't on the crew anymore. But that's what caused us to be less profitable. So really, it's just, it's business is business. I don't think anybody on this, um, this podcast here got in to work for someone or started their own business, not to make money. It, it sounds self-serving, but that's, that's why we're in business to provide share wealth, you know, shareholders wealth. Um, and, and if it's, if you're owning a business, there's stress and there's time and there's sacrifice from your family. So yeah, I, I really think it's not emotional, almost detached. Like you, you've got to hit these numbers. I like that. Thanks for clarifying on that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's so, uh, yeah, it's not personal. It's business. Uh, so question for Jen here, um, talking about growing and, and financial opportunity uh, from the optimist side of things. How does Optimus help to grow businesses financially? Yeah, by making it easy and affordable for their customers. You know, that's it. You know, we talk about not emotional. Well, from the consumer, you know, as a business operator or owner, we need that, that detachment, right? But if we put our, our consumer hat on, because, you know, most of us are, are, are both, right? If we look at it from con the consumer side as a customer, that's a very emotional experience for us. And so, again, we may go into it with some trepidation. You know, do I really want to spend whatever, $30,000 to put a new roof on my house right now? Um, do I want to build that gazebo out back? Do I want to have, um, you know, upgrade my lawn care service? Whatever those things, those are emotional decisions that we make as a, as a household, as a family, and, you know, according to our personal finances. So when going into that type of emotional decision-making, if the contractor can make it easy and affordable for their customer to do, then that's a win right there for on both sides. Beautiful. Yeah, I am. I'm like I'm thinking here, and I feel like almost any industry could benefit from this. Is that right? Because I know we've, we've mentioned HVAC, but I feel like almost any, right, any service industry could really benefit from something like from Optimus. Yeah, exactly. You know, if I want to get my pool repaved, um, if you know, again, if I want to put that gazebo out back, you know, whatever. You know, if we're talking about you know home improvement contractors primarily, and so so with that, the the easier that they can make it 
affordable to me, the more likely I am as a customer to say yes, right? When I go to Google, because that's probably where most of us get our shopping experiences now, um, and we go and we want to see the reviews, we want to have a sense of trust in that contractor before we even make the first phone call. And so the more easily that they are to be found online with the great Google reviews and, oh, great, I can get pre-qualified for financing right there from their website, great. I already have a sense of that, that emotional attachment now, as we talked right. earlier about, to that contractor, to that experience. It is going to be easier to get my buy-in. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you said that because that's usually what I do. Like, my first thing is I'll go on Google or I'm a Yelper. <laughs> I look at reviews. <laughs> like, if I can't find your business online, I'm really less likely to even go with you because you're not, you don't seem legitimate to me. So that's, that's a huge thing. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Online presence, brand. Is that something you help a lot of people with as well? Like as far as like, not just the financing, but like your brand, what is your business? That is, how do you get yourself out there? Yeah, absolutely. You know I mean? And so while we focus primarily on the, on that financing side, you know, we have partners such as Field Edge and some digital marketing partners that we work very closely with. And to have that, that integrated partnership on, on our side, right, on that vendor side, or to supply for that contractor, it just makes it easier for them. Again, that, that same, you know, if they trust us with their financing, they're going to trust my recommendation that Field Edge is a great CRM. They're going to trust right. a, a digital marketing partner that I recommend because they know that we have that, that close bond. And so I think that those are important, you know, as vendors even to look at it, to be able to offer good things. You know, just like I may um, ask my HVAC contractor, hey, do you have a, a plumbing recommendation if they don't do it? You know, do you have an electrician recommendation if I need it? So all of those things, I think, from the contractor community, building that network up as well helps with that brand recognition and management. Yeah, and that's huge. One thing you hit on, Jen, there, too, is that um, having the ability to fill that out on the website. So the, the, the basically the, the term they call a zero moment of truth. So that's when you actually know your lead exists. And Becky, Becky you hit on it. Tw on average, 20 to 25 percent of that buying decision actually happens before the contractor or business owner actually knows that lead exists. So if you can go out and have that social presence, you can have the link on the website to get pre-approved. All those things are happening before you actually have that interaction with that person. So once they submit that financing, then you know that lead exists. But that zero moment of truth before that, that really is a key area where we need to go out and provide free and valuable information and continue to build those leads and brand awareness to actually um, get them to know, like, and trust us. Because believe it or not, like 20 to 25% of that buying decision, you don't even know what's happening before they actually contact mm -hmm. you. That's so true. It annoys my friends though, because I, uh, I'm like, it's like four stars or three stars or less. No, we can't do it there. We can't do it. We can't do it. <laughs> I, but seriously, I do. It's, it's you, like you, both of you mentioned it. Like I read thoroughly through reviews. I look at the positive and the negative. I make comparisons. Like it's it's a huge, and that's how we think consumers, right? Even on Amazon, everything. So something as a business owner to take into mind for your business for sure is like how are you presenting yourself uh, out there. Yeah. And, you know, Becca, I would also add on to that, you know, especially coming out post COVID consumer buying habits have changed, right? I think Mikey mentioned that where most of that does start online. And so for contractors that have been doing this 20, 30 plus years, are we changing from the contractor's perspective? Mm -hmm. Are we changing our sales process to match those needs of today's consumer? And, you know, going into younger generations, um, I think, what, over 50% of all real estate transactions happen by millennials, Gen Zers. So are we as contractors, you know, going more towards that pattern of what the consumer wants versus what we want to push them like we've done for 30 years? Most are not. I just replaced the roof and the siding <laughs> from a mass hailstorm. And Eugene was awesome sales guy, but he wanted to meet me five times. I was like, send me the electronic copy. I'm going to click and sign. I just need to check this off my checklist. So he lost two sales in the cul-de-sac down the street that I'm looking at right now because literally there were younger consumers and they would not tolerate it. So if we haven't adopted the new buying habits, we need to because that shift has already happened. So the contractors that are winning are going digital. Uh, they're having electronic signature. They're going to have the online financing. They're going to have a PCI compliant credit card forms and speed kills. If you're not fast, someone else is going to close. So we need to be able to have that hopefully 24-7 off a website with, with eventually some AI built in and that technology is coming. Well, it's already kind of here already. Okay. 
So for for both of you guys here, um, this might be a little more towards Mike, but you guys definitely both answer it. Uh, when it comes to pricing or payment related bottlenecks that you guys see in your business, uh, what are they, and what are some of the best ways that you can avoid them? Yeah, Jen, if you want to hit it you first, just cut out cash and checks all. Uh, Mike, why don't you take this one? Yeah, so we're, we're in your wheelhouse here. <laughs> so, you're, so Ryan, if, if I'm understanding you, you're talking about pricing objections, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, pricing objections are just things that get in the way of you getting the money from a client. Yeah. So let, let's kind of start in the sales cycle. So um, really what it comes down to before we even offer a price is we need to be doing something called uh, short-term education. So we need to educate them how a, con a professional does it. And what we're doing in a real basic example like lawn mowing is we may be educating them around how to sharpen the blades, how to balance the blades, proper mowing height for that time of season. Most people think as lawn mowing is like the chuck in the truck. Anybody can do it. We're actually providing value of what a professional is going to do to that specific service. Okay. And then we talked about sales and price objections. We don't trust the contract and we definitely don't trust ourselves hiring them. So why are we different? How are we different? What are the concerns around that service? So rain delay or uh, closing the fence gate. So the home cleaning company that actually is one of our is is one of our clients now. Um, Tina talked about what happens if something gets broken. What happens if something gets stolen? What do you need to be home? So really, before we ever get to the conversation of price, we're building a higher perceived value so we can charge the highest price. And we're overcoming any sales or price objections up front. So we're shortening that sales cycle. Now, Ryan, I give you that estimate. You, most of those concerns are pulled away. So now it's not a transactional or price-based decision as long as you're in the ballpark. Um, but it's the work that comes up front through before zero moment of truth that we're out there, we're branding, we're providing value, people get us. And then uh, through an automated process or even manual process specifically to the service they're interested, we're heading that head on. So what I'm telling you is basically you can be probably the high, highest charged per, price person in your market, long as you provide the value. Simple growth was the first to market with automations. We set the price, we set the terms of the game, but we were able to fulfill on it. We were able to educate it and we were the leader um, right out the gate. Um, and everybody kind of followed suit on the pricing as you see in like other service business, people charge literally a hundred dollars less an hour than we do. Um, we're still growing at 40 to 50%, but we're having that process. So two different industries, same exact thing, sales are sales. Now you get to the question of the payment part, this is the way we operate and this is what we do. Um, and if it doesn't fit our model, then it's not scalable. Um, it may get you to 250 to half a million, maybe a million, but it's not going to get you to scale beyond that. Um, so it's really a, a determination that you got to build from the beginning and stick to it. Um, but if you have five different payment options um, and different options, that's really tough for a virtual assistant or an admin to follow. Um, so it's really, there's no choice. That's how we operate. Um, and we used to do uh, different installment plans for seven to $10,000 um, SA setups and deep dives. And now it all has to be prepaid and 50% deposit. And that was a concern out the bat that that may affect us, but really um, it didn't at all, it, but it helped with cash flow. And then you avoided all the delinquent payments. So we'd love to hook up with somebody with Jen. So if somebody doesn't have the ability to pay 100% up front, cool, finance it. That would be an awesome option. Um, but we haven't been able to find that type of vendor yet in our software as a service ecosystem. Perfect. I think that's a, that's a pretty good segue. So Jen, if somebody's mm -hmm. not using Optimus right now, uh, how do they get started with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if they are not currently financing, it, it would, it's, would be like a good contractor that says, I don't currently take credit cards, right? Again, yeah. we, have, we, have to, we have to giddy up to the times here. Um, but with Optimus, I mean, again, we give a three-tiered, lender approach so that we see approvals across all consumer credit profiles and enrollment with Optimus is very simple. It's about a 15, 20 minute online application. Of course, you know, again, we want to simple and streamline this kind of our theme around here. And so do that, go through the onboarding process. One of the great things about Optimus is that there's no cost to enroll. Um, and there's no cost for any an ongoing training and support that either myself or somebody from my team provides. And so we go out, we do on-site trainings, we do virtual trainings, and we really are there throughout the, the life cycle of that business to be the experts in financing. 
you know, as contractors, you guys can go out and be experts in lawn care, house cleaning, HVAC, whatever the case may be, but let us be your financing partner. And as a true partner, because again, we're not a lender, we are a nonprofit, we are able to really guide and help coach you along the way. And if we need to make some modifications, right, if it's shoulder season, we need to throw some more aggressive financing options out there, then that's what the Optimus team is here for, to really help you and say, okay, again, now we're going into to our busy season, great, we can scale it back and, and maybe just offer bare bones and we know we're still going to close those jobs. So, you know, we really take pride in, in being that that finance expert for our contractors. Love it. I don't need to handle. <laughs> no, I was like, it really hit on because I, I've seen like those people that I've worked with where it's like, they, you're giving so much power to your clients. Like it's like, okay, you can pay with check or cash or this or that. It's like, you're giving them more power over your business. It's like, you need to make it more simple. The whole process that I'm hearing, like just make it all simple to streamline this um, and get paid faster. <laughs> so Mike, you mentioned something interesting as well um, earlier. I'm gonna like backtrack a little bit with like bundling the credit card expense or fees into the services. How often should you be looking at that? Because, you know, so oftentimes people will do that after the fact on the invoice, maybe bulk add another fee, but adding it up front just can eliminate all that backhand or back end process and mistakes that can happen commonly if you have to do that manually. Yeah, so the consumer's A is not used to it. B, some states, I believe it's actually illegal to charge that on the invoice. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some things we want to look at. But if you're going to Amazon, there's not a credit card processing mm -hmm. fee at the end of that. It's all bundled in. So uh, it, it's really, it's minimal. Um, so it's, it's about 3% ballpark on a credit card processing. And we should be going in at least once a year. So going into 2023, end of December, we should be looking at um, our, our operating cost per man hour. And if you're a larger operation, it's per division. So if you're doing maintenance and construction or design build, those hourly uh, break even numbers are going to be different. So if it's a larger operation, you want those financial numbers per division. Um, but if we're going to do credit card processing, predominantly, you're not going to do that on a larger ticket item um, like a roof or siding or design build. That's where Jen would definitely come in and her product there. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing like weekly lawn maintenance, that's probably something that somebody's not going to finance. Um, but we just, we need to build that 3% into that right off the bat. Um, and that's just incorporated in your hourly, hourly rate. Um, and it's, it's, it's just that easy. It's just, it's not emotional, but the consumer doesn't know. Yeah, exactly. just, you've absorbed it. Right. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, we see that if we think about it again, we put our consumer hat back on. If we go shopping at Best Buy or Lowe's or whatever, you know, I don't say, okay, I want this TV. Oh, are you going to pay your credit card? But, you know, now it's a different price. Whether you pay cash, card, or finance, right? Because maybe you see a 70-inch TV that you buy because it's 12 months, same as cash, versus the 60-inch that your wife said you were allowed to come home with. You know, <laughs> that might be, hey, honey, it was 12 months, same as cash. I got that, you know, that <laughs> for us. But we know that that cost of the financing, the credit card, anything is, is across every single product in Best Buy, in Lowe's, right? Right. It's, you know, if I go buy a candy bar for my kid at the end of the day, then I know that, that there's a portion of that that is going to pay for someone's 12 months, same as cash, 70 inch TV. So it's, it's just, and if we think about it as a contractor, we incorporate that price into the cost of every single product and service that we offer, just like payroll for insurance. Yeah, the world has already kind of gone that way. So we should, uh, we should join them instead of taking a hit for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I was going to say, this is great what you guys are doing here on the Profit Roadmap. I love the fact that we're bringing education to contractors. Um, I mean, contractors literally traditionally are really good technicians. Uh, as Ger Michael Gerber say, a lot of us are technicians and entrepreneur seizures. We are really good at doing the work. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of us uh, learn the hard way before we go out and actually get an education. So the ability to go in and pop in some earbuds when you're out in the field and actually get this education is huge. Um, but that that's the thing that... Um, why I'm so passionate about what we do is, is we've been through some really good times. We've been through some rough times and we, we got some of it right, but some of it we definitely didn't. Um, but that's the beautiful thing of the explore community and bringing people in like Jen and you guys here. Um, it's a safe place for us to actually help talk to each other and actually educate each other. Uh, Cause let's face it. 
uh, being an entrepreneur, it's, it's a lonely place. It's like you're stuck on an island and you just think you're the only person who doesn't know their operating costs. You're the only person who can't go out and figure out how to get things financed for your consumers. Um, this is a great resource for people to actually go out and get that support and understand that there's hundreds, if not thousands of other people at the exact moment going through the same issues you're having. Um, and that's, that's the scary thing with owning a business. Nobody will actually go out and tell you how to do it. Um, and the stuff they're teaching in school is outdated, and not accurate. Uh, but places like uh, the SEC Edge uh, conference and the podcast here, it's just a great resource. And I appreciate you guys providing it. Happy to. Absolutely. You mentioned something also with, I think you both mentioned, Jen and Mike, like um, around knowing your numbers, budgeting, um, all of that stuff. And like if someone's listening in and there's someone that, doesn't even have any of that, has no idea. Would you say the best place to start is getting a software, getting something like Service Autopilot or Field Edge, getting into a groups like Academy and things like that, because you have to start somewhere, right? To kind of figure out that end game with, you know, pricing and invoicing and how much you should be making, um, you know, at the end of the day. Would you say that's kind of like a, a good start? Or other yeah, it's, it's a, it's, that yeah, it's, it's a good place to start. At the end of the day, though, um, yeah. the CRM, the customer uh, relationship management software, um, such as Service Autopilot to work, it, it basically, the main thing is you, you need QuickBooks or something like that. That's definitely, in my opinion, a non-negotiable. Um, and then you would like it synced possibly with a two-way sync like we have with SA uh, into QuickBooks online or desktop. Mm -hmm. The, the, I think the biggest misconception though is that your finances and your, your, basically your taxes and your budget happen inside that financial software like QuickBooks. The estimating, the job cost and reporting happen in that CRM. So you really, they kind of got to come together and play out. Um, so we need to know how many hours in the field um, are we're production, how many we're estimating and admin work. Um, but we really need to be able to define those two and actually drive it in. Um, most companies are looking at it, especially uh, HVAC probably as well, is, is a, it's a more system, a multiple overhead recovery system. And what you're looking at is we, we tackle your labor, we tackle your G&A, general administrative costs. That's those fixed costs. Whether you do one job or 100 jobs, that's going to be fixed costs to the office, insurance, things like that. And then your third piece is going to be your equipment. Um, and going through a process like that, it allows you to basically have set hourly rates for more equipment heavy jobs versus more labor heavy jobs. And we'll have a non-emotional way to go in and set an hourly rate with a break even per, per division. Um, so they all kind of play in, in together. Um, and then at service autopilot, they have the ability to track labor and labor burden, uh, which is basically your payroll. And then labor burdens can be FICA unemployment, workman's comp, a few other one, things like holiday pay, but basically it's a fully loaded labor burden. And when you're clocking in and out of that mobile, uh, the system automatically will calculate your direct cost, labor and labor burden on each job, and then your indirect cost, that non-billable drive time, shop time. Um, and we can track that based on the individuals actually clocked in at each job. So if you came to me and we work together and you're like, hey, our pricing matrices, our job costing, it's all tied together. Um, we're, we're hitting our times, but we're not making the money and profit we thought we were. First place is I'm looking is, in those automated reports, where are we looking at it? Is it the actual on-site? No, that looks good. So it's that non-billable time. And what you probably find is your guys or girls are driving halfway across town on that, those 90 degree days for those Wendy Frosty because they're so good, but they don't realize they're depreciating <laughs> all the profit. But it, it, it gives you that, once again, that non-emotional look. Um, but it's, it's a holistic approach. It's not just QuickBooks. It's not just Service Autopilot or Field Edge. Um, it's the two of them working together and having that data kind of talk to each other. Um, but it's really just getting down to the, those numbers because most people, you can plug all the stuff in and not look at it, but you need to know what is that hourly goal revenue wise? What's that break even mm -hmm. and budget versus actual. And when you have those kind of guardrails, if things get a little wonky, um, you're good. And in a cautionary tale after that divorce I talked about, uh, we'd always done these things, but after getting back into becoming a nightclub DJ and kind of going out and partying too much, uh, <laughs> I started looking at that bank account balances. A lot of business owners do. I had never done that. Um, but if I had a hundred to $120,000 cash in the bank operating, traditionally that was the normal amount of money that at that point fluctuated in the operating account. Um, and that was there. But what happened is Tammy and Christine were so good at getting bills paid. The money was, we were getting the money in before the bills were due. It didn't catch me until November or December. 
but we lost 70 or $75,000 that summer. Um, so that's, that's the cautionary tale. If you're watching that bank account balance, and you're not actually watching these things. You can get yourself in some major, major trouble quick. But it's, it's all the service, all the, so the software, QuickBooks, and potentially um, groups like Academy or things like that that are going to actually have you around other individuals that are going through the same problems as a support network. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I would add on, Mike. You know, it, it, exactly what you just said. But then I think that that, that community relationship um, with there's so many different groups out there and training organizations and, you know, podcasts like this where they can go and feel like they're not alone, you know, that it's not, you know, because that can be a little inundating to be like, wait, I need QuickBooks and I need what? And I'm, I'm already confused. What did you say? So when you go and you have that community of like-minded professionals and entrepreneurs to really be able to fall back on and to learn from some of their pitfalls and their successes, then having that community relationship really, I think, is what gives a lot of contractors that, that push to say, okay, I'm going to take it to the next level. I'm going to increase my professionalism and my brand identity. And, and I see what, what this guy over here did and how successful he was. If he can do it, so can I. Uh, and to add on that, get out of your local market. Because I always thought business was business. Yes. And this is how you did it in my local market. As soon as I got out, out of upstate New York, there was a whole different world. Um, and man, you just bring one of those little nuggets from a, a two to $3,000 conference. You bring it in and you implement it. It's, it's a game changer. Like, and people are looking at you like, how did they do that? Um, but if you look at everybody mm -hmm. around you and you think that's the way business is done, that you're not seeing the big picture. You got to get out of your local market. Awesome. See, I want to plug. Come to our conference this year, November. <laughs> <laughs> Meet other people. Maybe you, guys, you get to bring <laughs> Maybe you'll be crazy enough to put me back on the main stage for six years straight here. So it'll be, it'll be crazy. <laughs> I'd do it. I got my vote for sure. <laughs> so Jen, I have a question for you as far as like, we may have touched, I think we've touched on this a few times um, in a roundabout way, but like a service business that uses Optimus, like how do they present that to a customer? Does this get them signed up? Is it as simple as, hey, do you finance your phone? Do you finance this? So like, how do they, they get that, that buy-in? Yeah, and, and so, you know, we, we handle all of this training for them to help them to to incorporate it into their sales process. One of the things that I love most about Optimus is the flexibility that it provides to a multitude of different contractors and multitude of different types of sales processes. But, you know, I think one of the, the easiest analogies that I can think of is, you know, when you go to buy a new car, right? If, even if you walk into the lot or you're shopping online for your car, right? Do they say, or watch a car commercial even, you know, they say drive off the lot for $200 a month. They don't say come to the lot with $80,000 in your pocket, right? <laughs> so what we try to do is teach them to lead with affordable monthly payments. When we can lead with affordability and, I mean, of course, if we pay monthly payments, then that, that stings into most people's brains that, okay, I'm going to finance this. But so if we teach them how to, um, you know, know what they, based off of different types of financing plans, are we offering 12 months savings cash or are we putting them in a low interest, longer term loan? We can still calculate those monthly payments. And when they go into that sales process and say, hey, here's what we can do, you know, we can put your new roof on for $300 a month or well, you know, whatever the case may be, um, then I think that that's really the starting point. And then again, just making it simple, saying, hey, here's our application. While I do diagnose your system, you can just fill out this application from your own device. You know, two minutes to pre-qualify, less than 10 minutes, start to finish. So keeping it simple and really just leading with those affordable monthly payments. And I've noticed that's a trend for this uh, this episode is just get it, get in front of it. Get in front of it. Get the information out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to make life easier just for that whole sales process. Um, on that note, right, for financing stuff, uh, Jen, you kind of mentioned this earlier, talking about TVs and, and what you might come home with if you have financing options. Uh, when it comes to upsell, uh, do you guys have any techniques around that that kind of allow us to go into that? Like if I can finance something instead of paying cash for it, well, now I might get, a, I might get something better instead of just, uh, just what I thought I could afford. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, 
Typically, what we see on about 70% of our applications is that the consumer is given a higher line of credit than what the actual cost of the job is. So that gives that contractor that ability to say, okay, if it's HVAC, are we adding in indoor air quality? Are we adding in, you know, no matter the, the market, a three to five year maintenance program, something to help create that sticky relationship with the customer. Um, and again, we're changing that monthly payment by maybe five, 10, $15 keeping it affordable, and that customer is getting more solutions than what they thought they could afford. And on the contractor side, you're selling higher tickets. And so you're making your profitability there as well. Perfect. This honestly makes me want to like look around my house to see what we need to get, get fixed right now. I'm a vendor who uses often. We're Seriously. just getting a, a roof What's after hurricane. Yes, so. <laughs> Yeah. It's, I can uh, see the other screen yelping been, right now. It's a problem. It really is a problem, but it's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Ryan, if I could hit on your question there with Jen a little bit, uh, yeah, not necessarily on the financing, but um, kind of upsell or expansion plays. One of the biggest things we also see <laughs> is um, a mistake that I made, at least in the beginning of the year, beginning early years, is we try to sell everything to everybody all off the bat. Uh, really, it, it's, it's simplicity going in um, to be able to create that expansion or upsell play. So when it comes right down from lead acquisition, we're going out and, and literally casting a digital net through digital marketing across the whole entire service area. And then we would go to offline marketing to actually fill route density. But that's kind of the, the, the set of bringing them in. But when we actually go out and actually acquire that lead, um, a lot of a lot of contractors are, are really um, looking to sell everything at once. What we're going to recommend is you sell these gateway services. These, these things that can be closed over the phone by an admin, virtual assistant around the world. It doesn't matter. But it's literally something that can be done through satellite imagery or a um, basically a phone intake form. So lawn care is really easy, satellite imagery, turf square footage, linear feet, uh, home cleaning, really through a phone intake form, uh, home square footage, confirm it on Zillow very quickly. It's open on another screen. How many people there live there? Uh, Debbie Sardone, one of the influencers in the cleaning industry calls it a dirt code, but literally number of people, pets, bedrooms, bathrooms, and you're able to give a live quote right over the phone. So we're selling the the quick services, lawn care, fertilizing, perimeter pest right over the phone. And we go in and about 30 days later through an automated process, we kick in and sell uh, additional uh, expansion or upsell opportunities there. But what we really want to be looking at is thinking about how do we create that simple business and how do we actually create a process where we're not running all different types of equipment and different SOPs for each type of service. While we're doing a simple example like lawn mowing and fertilizing, we can do the mowing and then we're going to upsell fertilizing, perimeter pest, uh, fire ant control, anything that can be done in the same truck with adding a couple hundred dollars worth of equipment. What we've done is now taken a client lifetime value of say $2,000 and ramped that up to maybe $4,500. But the cool thing is that non-billable drive time now um, is being eliminated. So it's even more profitable because you're doing the service while you're already there with basically the same equipment. Um, and that's where we see the success uh, going in there. But really, um, that whole thing, speed kills. If you're too slow, you're not going to win. Get them off the market non-emotionally and then upsell them. Um, but if they're asking for three different services like lawn mowing, fertilizing, and say mulch install, well, let's sell the gateway services that we can measure online close those and then say, cool, within two business days or so, we'll be out to actually measure that property and get a specific price for the mulch. And if you can see it on satellite, you can at least give a ballpark range. Because what we want to do is just get them emotionally off the market um, and stop shopping you. Because literally, if you don't pick up the phone or you don't get them instant gratification like they have on Amazon and all these other uh, post-COVID uh, buying habits, they're going to just literally go down just like Becca. They're running down Google or Yelp and just like <laughs> key keyboard heroes. Who's going to answer the phone? I need to get this off right. the checklist. So um, that's, exactly. that's, 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 that's the key to success right now in this post-COVID world. It, even pre-COVID it was, but now it's been accelerated. Uh, the younger generation, even like my parents in their 70s, are, are expecting that instant gratification where originally they'd be cool waiting a week to get an estimate. They're not anymore. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. Like, I don't like having so many choices. It's like overwhelming. So if, like, if, I, if you can sell me and you can, it's reasonable, it's affordable. And, and yeah, like. And man, I'm if they've in. already gone online and filled out that finance form <laughs> right. and they're ready or approved. Yeah, exactly. It's not trans. It's even it's better. It's not really price sensitive. Yep. And with lawn mowing within four to five bucks a visit or fertilizing or even 
even a couple hundred dollars or the larger ticket item, it's not going to matter. That speed is what they want. They just want to get it done. Absolutely. Yeah, people are willing to pay more for more sustainable products now. They're willing to pay more for that instant gratification. You know, I mean, Instacart has changed my life. I, you know, I don't even want to go into a grocery store anymore. And I'm willing to pay for that convenience, right? I can just go to my back porch and pick it all up. So it, the consumer habits have certainly changed. So, that's so true. She shipped my mom's, uh, she loves Amazon Prime, so everything's delivered through Amazon or, yeah, Grubhub. Every, yeah, Post is the post-COVID kind of world. The whole, we have to, you to grow with it. You all have been saying this whole time, we have to learn to adjust our businesses, our practices, our processes to this new world we live in. Yeah, and it's yeah. gotten so much to the point that they will just literally drop it off at the door. I don't even have to say, hi, how are you? Are you having a good day yeah. today? I, I can go get after, after they're down the driveway, you know, so. Yeah, and the consumer doesn't want to talk to us. So two-way texting, uh, messaging over Facebook or other their social platforms, um, we can't force the consumer really to go and buy the way we've always wanted them to buy or the way they have in the past. We've got to adapt and get ahead of that. So uh, customer payment portal on SA, uh, which is service autopilot, two-way texting, um, those things are really, really important um, to be able to do that. And that uh, the ability to actually go on and get 24 seven quotes is, is really the next, the next shift um, that's happened in most industries before the service industry. I've seen that pretty much everywhere is like, no one wants to talk on the phone these days. Like I was, I was talking, I was talking to somebody about it the other day. It's like, I can't remember the last time I like ordered a pizza online or well, <laughs> I'm on phone. That's all online now. Yeah. Every, everything I do is online going, like going to the grocery store. I can Instacart it. It's easy. So it's not necessarily uh, going back to what Mike was saying and, and just kind of looping it back around. It's not necessarily casting the widest net. It's uh, mm -hmm. getting the net in the right spot and then enhancing yes. it from there. Well, your target audience. <laughs> for sure. Mike and Jen, thank you for being guests on the Profit Roadmap podcast. Uh, so any closing thoughts? Like, Mike, if, if people want to learn more about you, Simple Growth, where can they find you? What are your social medias, email, all of that? Yeah, uh, probably the best way is our website, uh, simplegrowthsystemswithans.com. Um, check us out on Facebook, uh, really in the mindset of abundance uh, as well on the website. There's hundreds, if not uh, over a thousand videos now. We will literally just show you how to do the things that you're asking how to do. And if it's something you're going to do yourself, great. If you don't have the time or you don't have the skill set or just don't want to do it, uh, reach out. We're here. But really, um, after all the things we've done in the business, uh, we're really here as a resource to just help people. Uh, the making the money part and that is just an added benefit that comes along. Um, and then hopefully uh, we get to see everybody at uh, SEC 2023 coming up here in Dallas um, in November. Looking forward to that as well. My team and myself will be there for sure. So uh, Becca, Ryan, really appreciate you guys what you're doing here for the industry. And uh, thanks for having me on. Glad to have you. Thank you. Glad to have you. And you, Jen, where can people learn more about you, Optimus, and all the great things y'all are doing? Yep, absolutely. Again, website is probably the quickest and easiest way. That's going to be at optimistfinancing.com. Um, again, same thing across social media platforms. And um, really appreciate you guys having me on. I think that this was a great conversation and a lot of value add for our contractors. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone listening in to the Profit Roadmap. And please remember, you can listen to us on all major streaming platforms, including Apple, YouTube, Spotify, and more. And please be sure to visit our website at serviceautopilot.com forward slash podcast to get this link to the topics we discussed in today's episode. And if you have questions or guest recommendations, if you want to be on the show and chat with Ryan and I and just have fun, <laughs> email us at profitroadmap at explore, that's explore with an X, X-P-L-O-R, technologies.com. If you enjoyed today's show, please tell a friend. This was Becca and Ryan. You all have a great one.